I'm going to lose my suit. That's my suit. Don't take it. Drop my bag on your suit. It's one up there. Look at the bits and small. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we're meeting today on the lands of the Wurundjeri and the Boon Wurrung people uh, who never, of the Kulin Nation who never ceded these lands uh, and who are still living under conditions of colonial structures and policies. I um, pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. Uh, I'm John Barnett and I'm very pleased to chair this seminar today from Associate Professor Sapphire O'Neill from the School of Geography. Department it's a department of geography, the University of Exeter, which is uh, very well known to us, and Saffron will be known to many of you. She was a research fellow uh, in our university some years ago, quite a few years ago. Uh, Saffron, perhaps one of the most interesting researchers on climate change. She, she is really interested in visual communication of climate change. What do the images tell us? And very transdisciplinary, a researcher who works across lots of different disciplines, a geographer, but works with people in psychology and marketing and computer science, and also is really interested in research that affects change, trying to use visual images to engage people better to drive more constructive uh, climate change responses. There's not many researchers you'll meet doing climate change or as interesting in their kind of disciplinary position and orientation as that one. So I'm very pleased that she's taken the time to talk to us today. And thank you everyone for coming. Over to you. Thank you, John. Hi everyone and thanks John for that lovely introduction. So I was John's postdoc for three years. I think that's the nicest words I've ever heard John say about me, so I'm glad it's recorded. Um, but no, it's a real pleasure to be back here working with um, colleagues from the past and uh, meeting many new colleagues as well. So uh, thanks for hosting this seminar and inviting me to take part. So I'm going to be talking about, uh, the, um, I'm on a fellowship at the moment, um, the Visual Life of Climate Change, it's a Leverhulme two-year fellowship, which is an absolute joy after um, uh, maternity leaves, pandemics, working part-time, and not having any funded research projects. So back into research in a really sort of deep way for the first time in about seven years. Um, but my work has always been about climate change communication and increasingly about um, visual communication. And um, so I'm going to start by talking about why should we care about images and then what about climate news specifically. So my work, I'm interested in all different kinds of images, infographics, photographs, um, you know, kind of um, computer visions of the future and so on. But a lot of my work has focused on the role of news as a major source of information for people about climate change and in shaping how we think and feel and respond to the issues. 
Um, and I'm going to go through some of my work, some of which I did when I was here working with John, um, uh, you know, a decade ago now, um, uh, to talk about how do people engage with climate images, what are the images that are out there in the news, and how do people engage with those images. And then I'll move on in part four to um, think through um, uh, certain types of climate images and how they shape how we think, feel and respond to climate change. Um, so I'll particularly talk about polar bears and how time shapes how we feel about particular images. And then I'll talk about the changing face of climate protests. And this is some of the work that I've been doing led by one of my fantastic PhD researchers, Sylvia Hayes. And then uh, lastly, about adapting to climate risk through talking about heat waves, which I realise is always an amusing thing to talk about in an Australian context. But we did have the first 40 degree day ever in the UK last summer. So heat waves becoming a really, um, you know, a, a particular heat risk um, in the UK, as well as obviously something that you're dealing with um, uh, many summers in a row. Although I hear that the last three years have actually been quite cool. Um, yeah. And then uh, a Q&A at the end, which I think John's going to chair, which would be helpful because uh, presumably the online questions as well. OK, so first of all, I'm sorry, you've got this little thing. Let me see if I can move that so you can see a bit better. Um, what does climate change look like? Well, I went on um, uh, Google uh, search last week when I was putting these slides together. Um, what kind of, you know, you could choose a whole bunch of different climate images that come up with climate news. But I just wanted to uh, give you this one example from The Guardian, which many of you will know, obviously has an Australian outlet as well. Um, and you might think, oh, that's a really kind of typical climate image. There we are. It's a, a flood. It's a flooding event that's been kind of linked to climate change or increasing incidents of flooding linked to climate change, at least. And there's a woman there holding her child on her hip. Actually, um, and it, you know, it constructs the idea that climate change might be linked to this flood, that there's a victim in some way. But these kind of visuals um, already invoke a whole bunch of ideas about how we might respond. And this is a really common kind of visual trope for disasters. We see it also in kind of humanitarian imagery as well. The idea that the woman is a woman standing there. She's got a child on her hip. There's no men around. There's no supportive structures around that. She's not in a house. And she's not um, having any kind of chats with people in power. It's already constructing. She's a victim. She has no power. She's being impacted. And um, so there's a whole bunch of things around gender and positionality that you might not originally think about, but which are deeply linked to how we kind of interpret that image. And of course, I should say that although unlike text, you know, you don't need a language to interpret an image, they're still culturally constructed. So this image will be read in different ways in different places. So imagery is important because it's ubiquitous, it's everywhere, right? It surrounds us. When we go on social media, it's increasingly an image uh, dominated kind of medium or obsessive media, uh, Instagram, TikTok, and so on. The things that kick off, they're images, they're memes, you know, they're using visuals, and they play a really key role in communication. In terms of news, they are really important. If you, I know there's many other scientists in the audience today, Karoli, I'm sure David and others, have been in the case where they've given interviews and thought, you know, that's a really powerful piece of science uh, that we've just done. Um, and then it doesn't make the news. And the reason is because there's no compelling visuals from the news perspective. Not saying that, you know, David's lovely face on the ABC News <laughs> isn't going to, you know, top out the broadcast. But um, in, in news terms, you need compelling visuals. If you don't have compelling visuals, your story just doesn't run. Um, and, and finally, images affect news reception, how we engage with the news. So images help to draw viewers in, to tell them what the story's about, uh, to help you remember information, and, and they influence our sharing behaviour. Any of you on Twitter, the first thing Twitter will tell you to do if you want to increase your audience engagement is put an image with your tweet. And that will increase your engagement on average by about 60-70%. So image is really important um, for how we share and engage with information. On climate imagery, it's important because it's a key part of setting the frame. So telling us what's important, who's, who are the powerful voices, who's missing, uh, what the potential solutions are, the remedies, um, and, and also, you know, what's not important, what's not included. And climate imagery affects our emotional response, um, but also even our behavioural intentions. So some work done quite a long time ago now by Anthony Lazarus, who many of you will know, at Yale, um, showed that the images that we hold in our minds are affective images, which are very uh, linked to the images that are out there in the kind of social political world, um, are, are shape how we might vote on climate policies. But despite its key role, imagery, climate imagery, particularly is studied far less than ten. And there's a couple of reasons for this. One is that it's quite tricky methodologically. Imagery kind of cuts across multiple disciplines, as John put in a very kind way. I'm a sort of interdisciplinary, I am a geographer, but I do work with lots of different people from different disciplines. Um, uh, and that's kind of 
half of the course in visual research, it's hard to collect visuals. If you work on news media analysis and you work on tech, you can use LexisNexis or uh, Track Fever, stick in a few search terms, your date range, or, you know, on Google or anything like that and uh, pump out a whole bunch of, uh, of data. If you want to do images, you have to go on the image, individual news side, you have to collect each of the images, you can write scraping um, programs and so on, but it's a lot more tricky to collect. And also text is privileged in the academy, right? A bunch of researchers or people who work with researchers, academics, we know that text is privileged in the academy over, over visuals. So it's studied far less, but um, it is actually really, really important. So this is the point where I'm going to get a bit of audience involvement. So uh, hopefully you all know each other and don't feel embarrassed about this. I want you to make a little a little noise to every image that I put up here. OK, so this one might be like, mm, or something like that. Maybe, I don't know. Next one. OK. Always rely on the polar bear. <laughs> Waiting to see David's response to that one. <laughs> okay, so you can see that immediately you kind of get an emotional response to imagery. I mean, this is obviously just a kind of jokey point, but the frame that the images, you know, put us in are, are a key part of setting how we kind of think and act and, and engage with climate change. So going to some, some actual research now. So this is uh, work that I did. Um, when I was a postdoc here, but written up when I was uh, uh, at my, what is now my job at Exeter University. Um, I looked over uh, over a year's worth of coverage, this is during 2010, I looked at every climate change story in these 13 newspapers in Australia, the UK and the US, um, and I wanted to know what does climate change news look like? So I uh, looked at every one of those images that occurred, and which may not surprise you, most of the images were of people, and most of those people were politicians. And then the second most common um, type of imagery was climate impact imagery, so flooding, fires, ice imagery, impacts on species like the polar bear. Um, there was a little bit of climate protest. I'll talk more about that later, but note that these are kind of zoomed out, loads of um, in people's faces. You can't see anybody individually, um, quite different to how things are now. Um, and very little of solutions. So, you know, renewable energy, actually not very much at all, nothing about really about how to connect with people's everyday lives. Um, um, okay, so if we've got what uh, the imagery looks like, how are people engaging with those types of images in um, in those three countries? So um, I worked with a bunch of great colleagues across Australia and uh, the US, as well as the UK, to do what we call a Q method study. So Q method's a really nice uh, um, uh, quantitative and qualitative um, research method. Um, and the scientists uh, will notice the normal distribution here. So effectively, I got a bunch of representative images, so 40 images from that um, newspaper study before, 40 representative images, printed them out sort of postcard size. And then I asked participants to sort them quickly based on their gut instinct on that sort A. This picture makes me feel climate change is important into three piles. Agree, disagree, don't have an opinion. Sort them really quickly. And then you take the, say, the agree pile. These, these pictures make me feel climate change is important. Yeah, I agree, that's the case. And you choose the two images that make you feel most strongly that climate change is important. And then you put them at the far end of the distribution. Then you keep on looking through what are the next three images that make you feel it's important and fill them out and so on and so forth. And then the same with the other end, um, the images that don't make you feel, uh, make you feel it's least important at the far end, class two and so on and so forth. And the ones in the middle are all those images that you didn't really have a strong response to. And then the nice thing about Q method is that then you chat to people afterwards, do an interview. So, you know, what, uh, why are these images at the important end? Why do you feel that these images make you feel it's not important? Um, and also pick out on key themes. So here you can see there's a whole bunch of people in the middle. So what is it about these people that are making you feel you don't have an opinion one way or another? So you've done that, you've done the sort, you've done the interview, you take all the images off, and then uh, I ask people to resort them on a different scale. This picture makes me feel I can do something about climate change. And the psychologist amongst you will notice that the first one is a, um, a kind of measure of salience, and the second one, sort B, a measure of self-efficacy, a feeling of being able to do something. And what we found is that the results, sorry, you can't really see this because there's a thing over the top, but the results are remarkably, hey? Oh yeah, that's a good idea. Fab, put that there. Um, the results are remarkably consistent both across and within country cohorts. So within the UK, the US, within Australia, people felt the same way about these images, but also um, across those three countries, people felt similarly, which was really interesting. So you're doing kind of statistical analysis about the Q sorts to see how the discourses are similar or different, finding that actually they're very similar across and between countries. 
So that indicated to us that there's a dominant or mainstream discourse about climate imagery, what that means. People are thinking in similar ways about climate images in those three countries. And those findings were that imagery of climate impacts promotes feelings of salience, so it makes people feel it's important, but it undermines self-efficacy, so it makes people feel that they can't do anything. Um, perhaps a little bit of a problem. Energy futures imagery makes people feel that they can do something, but remember that is the type of imagery we're not really seeing very much of. And remember, there are loads of pictures of politicians. Well, they make people feel really strongly that climate change is not important, which is potentially a problem because that's most of the imagery. Um, and we also found that images either appear to increase saliency, a sense of importance, or a sense of self-efficacy, being able to do something, but no image appeared to be able to do both. So you really need to think about what you're trying to do with your image, whether your audience don't know about climate change, you're trying to make them feel like climate change is something they should care about, or do they know about and care about climate change, but you really want them to feel engaged so that they can kind of take action. You might want to use different types of images. Okay, so moving on to some more recent work then, I'm going to talk through three different case studies, um, uh, polar bears, uh, protests and heat waves. So this is really a question of how um, image use has changed over time. Many of you will know the polar bear, you know, the cliched climate icon, the kind of, um, uh, yeah, uh, even David, At David Attenborough has said that the polar bear is, is, you know, the icon of climate change. Um, so as someone who works on climate change communication and particularly visual stuff, uh, I have loads of polar bear paraphernalia. Uh, when it comes to Christmas, everybody sends me polar bear Christmas cards. You know, um, people find cartoons of polar bears and they stick them to my office door. You know, um, they oh, I found a polar bear mug. Saffron, you've got to have this polar bear mug. I have a massive collection of polar bear stuff. Um, so I already had quite a collection and I noticed how things are kind of evolving with this kind of polar bear paraphernalia. Um, and I thought I'm going to do a bit of investigation about this and kind of track how these things are changing over time, how the visuals have been used. So I started off looking at Coca-Cola, you know, the polar bear sipping a Coke in the Arctic, having a fun time. And um, yeah, always Coca-Cola campaigns started to be linked to climate change in the 1990s, uh, 1990s early 1990s. And, and the idea really here was that um, polar bears were um, connected to climate change by scientists, only by scientists. Um, and there was always a direct connection. Sea ice was declining or potentially declining. Therefore, there was a, a risk for polar bear habitat. Um, so it was always a direct link. Polar bears were impacted by climate change because of changing sea ice. And you can see polar bears used in this, you know, where images were used and directly used to link to the story of climate change was about the polar bears population directly. So that's, you know, kind of past times to about the mid 2000s. Some really interesting stuff started to happen around the mid 2000s. Um, partly Al Gore's film, An Inconvenient Truth, which is quite old now. Um, but some of you might remember how there's a, a, a clip in there polar bear climbs onto an ice floe, the ice floe splits in half, climbs onto it, the half bit, and that splits in the half again. And then he climbs and he can't get it, and it pans out, and there's this polar bear swimming in this like vast Arctic Ocean. Um, uh, it's quite a powerful kind of little sequence. A lot of people have talked about it since. And then there's things like this, um, uh, Arnie Navarra's polar bear picture, um, climate meltdown, he called it, which won, ironically, the Shell Wildlife Photographer of the Year. Um, and this Vanity Fair issue, which has got Leonardo DiCaprio, the celebrity of the moment, on their green issue. And who else but, but beside him, Canute the polar bear, the German polar bear, who became so popular, was um, orphaned uh, at Berlin Zoo and looked after by his keeper. And um, adopted as a mascot by the uh, German uh, government for sort of environmental themes. So there's a whole bunch of things that start to connect the polar bear to um, politics, climate politics. But the bear is still not indistinguishable from its original kind of climate science link. And what I would say is that I also, this is a different study, um, looked at how images had changed, image use had changed over time. Um, so I did that study looking at the 2010 imagery. I wanted to know if things had changed. So I looked from uh, the early 2000s up to the late 2000s. And what was really interesting, the reason these are grayed out, or slightly grayed out, by the way, is because there's much less imagery down this end. So although these are percentages, you take them with a bit of a pinch of salt. So you can see this is the ice imagery, you know, the kind of classic drop of drip, drip ice um, and the polar bear on the left hand side there. Um, and the different newspapers, for those of you not familiar, the Daily Mail. <laughs> um, it's a, um, a, a mid-market 
Hackett, uh, ta uh, tabloid-ish, um, uh, often quite right-wing, newspaper from the UK, Telegraph, often more conservative-leaning as well, and The Guardian, more left-leaning, and The New York Times and Wall Street Journal as well, which have a slightly more complicated relationship in terms of ideology, uh, but broadly not New York Times left, uh, left and uh, Wall Street Journal right. Um, so what you can see is that ice cream in the uh, decades, then to climate change, whereas polar bear imagery starts to really ramp up from the middle of the uh, middle of the decade. But really interesting how it's only in certain types of papers, right? So only in the right leaning papers, and that's because the polar bear starts to be used as like this kind of political icon about right, climate change. Um, and in fact, I've talked to Guardian journalist, the Leo Hickman, he was the uh, environment correspondent at the time or environment editor of the Guardian, and he said they they tried not to ever use a polar bear. Um, because they realised it has started to become this sort of politicised icon. As we move from the term into kind of current times, I then argue in, in this 20, uh, 22 paper in Transactions of the Institute of British Geographers that polar bears become indistinguishable from climate change. The polar bear is nothing but climate change. And this is James Dillingholm, who's from that Telegraph newspaper, so he's a right wing columnist, climate contrarian, climate sceptic. And he, like this, the polar bear. It's not even, there's nothing about polar bears in his article. The only reason the image is there is because the polar bear has become this kind of politicized icon of all that is ridiculous about climate change. Here's the polar bear winking. How ludicrous that I could be affected by this thing called climate change in my pristine white, um, distant environment in the Arctic. And you've got the state of um, the polar bear report from Susan Crockford, the Global Warming Policy Foundation, which some of you might know about. They've been very keen to try to the uncertainty of climate science about polar bears. If only they can prove that polar bears are connected to climate change, the whole kind of climate change case falls apart, perhaps. And then in the middle here, this is from National Geographic. This is the most tweeted image, or most um, um, shared image online ever. It's been shared more than like two billion times online. It's crazy. Um, and they use that uh, image to connect um, with a, a climate change article saying this is what climate change looks like. And there was a huge outcry um, from contrarians and others who said, how do you know that this polar bear is impacted by climate change? Isn't it just that this polar bear is, um, you know, nutritionally deficient or, you know, might have some genetic mutation? Or how can you prove that climate change has impacted this one bear? Um, and it led to a retraction of, of the image and the story by, um, by National Geographic and having to kind of explain that, you know, is this climate change is what we expect, this is, you know, we can't prove it on this one there and so on. But it's really important to make sure that that climate image doesn't become, that image of the polar bear doesn't become the face of climate change to that audience. And then on the far um, left hand side there, you've got the climate bot from the BBC's uh, website. So a fire bot, you can just stick in questions and then the AI answers them for you. There's no explanatory uh, text needed. It's just polar bear, of course. A polar bear means climate change. So yeah, just to summarize them, in the early 90s, polar bears only linked to climate change by scientists, but there's this rapid politicization in the 2000s. And now um, bear images, I've argued in this paper and the transactions one, established as a visual metonym. They stand alone, even without text. And audiences in, in many countries, particularly Anglophone nations, but also in others as well, um, there's data in that paper from India, for example, too. And audiences have complex knowledge to decode these satirical, these parodic and cliched bear images. So polar bears now are nothing but climate change. They can mean nothing but climate change. Okay, moving on, you talk about the second case study then about climate change and protest. Um, so uh, from that longitudinal study, I already had all this newspaper data archive material, which as I kind of mentioned right at the start, it's really hard to collect. Um, you have to go to the British Library, you have to download, get a microfilm, you can only get four microfilms at a time, then you have to go to a library and ask for another four. It's really hard for, and takes a really long time. Um, so we had this newspaper archive already, and we look back through that to look for climate protest particularly. And what we found is that, yeah, there are these kind of simple pictures, protests, people with faces hidden, and uh, uh, police, and so on, all pictures of like zoomed out, like I showed before, where there are loads of faces, but a sea of faces, but not individuals. The protest and um, climate protest equals mass crowds, few faces, and the protest paradigm was really in evidence. So this is a kind of sociological um, theory, but protesters are socially deviant. They're seen as like pushing the status quo um, and, you know, sort of wrong and scary and dangerous, right? Um, so that's how climate protest was visually constructed during that time. 
But then my student, uh, Sylvia Hayes, looked at both Getty Images, one of the biggest sources of images worldwide, and also in digital newspapers, and she found things had really changed. So, um, the protesters in 2019-20 were pictured in individualised ways, so they weren't crowds of people, and the most pictures were of women and girls, so they weren't depersonalised and they weren't men. And really interestingly, children are pictured as powerful actors, so Sylvia's done a bunch of really interesting ethnographic research where she's been working with photojournalists, shadowing them and so on at, at the COP in Glasgow, for example, and they were telling her, yeah, I'd get down on my knees, right? so these are children and a photojournalist, generally a man, someone's a woman, um, but they're, you know, tall adult people, they're getting down on their knees to photograph up into these children's faces. They're making deliberate framing choices to make these children look powerful. Um, they're giving them eye contact and the camera angle suggesting agency rather than portraying them as victims. So really a big change to framing um, uh, climate protest as a, a sense of sort of intergenerational justice and equity. Um, and interestingly, um, for the first time, we think, we looked at where all these images were, uh, were from, and we found that overwhelmingly they're attributed to image collections. And this is important because we were thinking that climate imagery could do with <laughs> opening up a little bit. Where do we look to make interventions? Those commercial image agencies are really important in shaping that visual discourse globally. So Getty Images, Associated Press, Shutterstock, and so on. Okay, and finally, the third case study, I keep an eye on the time, so leave some time for questions. Um, uh, these are, this third case study is about adapting to heat waves. So a lot of the imagery I've talked about so far has been about kind of mitigation or kind of climate change information. And this is really about thinking, OK, so if climate change is a risk to which we're committed, um, um, things are changing, how, how do people get engaged with that idea of adaptation? Um, so visuals play a key role um, in how we're kind of imagining climate adaptation. What does it look like? What might it, what, what might it look like to live in a hotter world? Um, and of course, there are many risks beside heat waves, but heat waves is a really, really key one and, and quite easy to, to visualise well in some ways. So we did this study looking at climate change news, um, climate change and heat wave news. So all texts that mention climate change in any coverage about heat waves um, during 2019 in four countries, UK, France, Germany and the Netherlands. Um, and I had a great team working with me across those four countries. Um, so we could look at the visuals, which you can do obviously without knowing the language, but also at the text that went alongside those visuals. So we're looking at the news article and, and the text. And it's so interesting. We found that many of the visuals were what we call positively valent. So they made people feel that um, a heat waves were a, a fun thing, a good thing, something to look forward to, high days and holidays. But the text was very rarely positively valent. I think we had one, maybe two articles in the entire data set that were positively valent. So the text would often be talking about risk, heat wave risk, how to manage that risk, we're talking about deaths or illness, you know, the kinds of things that you might expect expect if you were running like a health agency for example you'd like to get into the news if you were talking about heat waves they you know they were kind of along those sorts of lines but the visuals were pulling in a completely different narrative direction um what was really fascinating and kind of concerning was that you'd have some really stark differences so you'd have some uh, one article i remember there was a woman flicking her hair back standing in a kind of city fountain with hotter than wasabi written on her t-shirt alongside uh, a headline that was talking about four people dying. And that, and that whole article was talking about how these, you know, the, how heat waves have caused these deaths. But this is an example of how cues go into visuals that would just totally not be acceptable in text. So in the newsroom environment, things kind of slip in through the visuals and indeed that we consume in our kind of, in our everyday lives that we don't kind of critique and don't think about, but actually a key to how, we are, how we're imagining these things. So things that are really, really quite problematic when you point them out. Um, what we found from looking at all these visuals is that there were two major visual frames, if you like. The first one was this idea of fun in the sun. So this is a really kind of classic example of this. People at the beach, having a fun time, eating an ice cream. Generally people playing in or beside water. They're not, as we say in the paper, they're not kind of images you wouldn't see, wouldn't be out of place in like your family photo album, if anybody has a photo album anymore. Um, or, you know, like a holiday brochure, something like that. Incidentally, we know from doing ethnographic research alongside photojournalists, the reason Brighton Pier in the UK appears in these pictures is because every time there's a heat wave, all the photojournalists who live in London get on the train line to the first beach, which is Brighton, and then they go and take those pictures of people having a fun time on the beach. 
So we know that there are points of intervention where things could change. But, um, and from talking to news agencies, they know that these things are problematic. But this is such a busy, hectic environment that these kind of cliches keep being perpetuated. Um, the second visual frame that we found, um, we weren't kind of necessarily expecting to find, was what we termed the idea of heat. And these were things that were like orange, red skies, you know, making you feel like a oh, hot, dangerous in Western cultures, at least. Um, or thermometers showing high temperatures. Um, sometimes things like people drinking, glugging water, silhouetted. But really interesting, the people that were there, they were only individuals. And almost always where they were, which was rare, they were like silhouetted against the sun. So you couldn't see their face. They're like sort of blacked out. So it's like a kind of shadow figure. So there was no kind of engaging person-to-person um, uh, -person communication going on. There were no groups of people. It was easy to kind of feel distant from the people that were represented when they were, which was rare. Yeah, and there's a real dissonance between the text and the images often. So to summarise then on, on this work, the first um, kind of conclusion from that paper is that these heatwave images that we're seeing in the European press, at least at the moment, on heatwave um, climate change news really are displacing concerns of vulnerability. They're really marginalizing the experience of those who are vulnerable to heat waves. So as you well know, that people who are vulnerable to, uh, to heat waves, young children, over 75s, people with pre-existing health conditions, and people in poor quality housing. Those people are virtually non-existent in the visual discourse. They might be in the text, but when we're talking about how to construct um, heat waves or how we imagine heat waves and adapting to heat waves in the future, those people are just not there. Um, interestingly, we had one organization. Um, Apologies to the Dutch, Algemeen Dagblad, a newspaper in, in the Netherlands that did uh, use different sorts of images. They were a very small organization and they're only one of very many in our data set, but they used images of elderly people eating, uh, I can never remember the word, an ice lolly, ice, icy pole. What's the translation? Thank you. Thank you. An ice block. Thanks, Catherine. Um, you know, eating, a, um, eating an ice cream in a care home or people. Um, a family shelter behind a fan, you know, a fan blowing at them in their house, looking visibly hot and uncomfortable, and not a family having fun at the beach, which of course isn't an everyday adaptation strategy. We can't all just go, ah, oh, sod work or uh, school or whatever, I'm off to the beach having fun time or going to sit in the water. Um, you know, showing people really affected in their sort of everyday lives. And interestingly, for the for the third one, the second conclusion there. Um, the other problem with these visual discourses is they're excluding opportunities for imagining a more resilient future. So there's no kind of images in there that are talking about how we might adapt to more extreme heat, um, particularly things like urban greening, for example, increasing urban shade, um, bringing urban heat um, uh, island effect down somewhat, um, or providing you know, community shelters for um, AC areas and things like that. So really very few of those images. But again, Aljamain Dagblad did have that kind of thing. It had one of those, you know, those sliding scale images where you pull the lever from one side to the other of a grey kind of unappealing platz uh, in the Netherlands that was then in an urban greening project. And they looked really, you know, attractive, lots of shade and green and people playing and so on um, uh, in, a, in a heat event, um, which was really interesting. So it's not self-evident. We don't have to use these sorts of images um, to illustrate heat waves. But at the moment, that is what is being used. We are kind of uh, limited to those things. Uh, if I can get the slide to change for the next one. Here we go. OK, so final slide here, just to say that most of my work is qualitative. I'm dealing with, you know, something from 100 up to maybe 1,000, 2,000 images. Um, I've increasingly been working with computer scientists who I say are my 2,000 visual data set is massive, you know, and they're like, uh, no, we need more like 40,000 images. Oh, right, okay. Um, I was doing completely different sorts of analysis. We're using computer vision. So looking at the pixels that are in those images to see what's similar and what's different, where different images are um, uh, kind of cropping up, what colors are used, looking at things like tone and saturation and so on. So really interesting work, Travis Cohen and our PhD student, Rani Mala, um, and um, other work we're doing in our group as well to look at heatwave visuals across the world. The one thing that was really interesting to see over the Pakistan um, Indian subcontinent heatwave is how different the visuals were. So again, it's not self-evident. You have to use funnel of sun to illustrate heatwaves. Pakistan and India, you can see just on those very straightforward Google searches, Google image searches, the images look very different. They're much more communicating about the risks that people are experiencing, who is marginalised, who's really affected by heat waves. So there's a lot of learning that could be done here from the global north, from the global uh, to the global north, from the global south.
Okay, so that's all of my um, uh, slides. Look forward to your questions. Thanks. Uh, that's one of the right. I'm not sure. Here, aren't they? Oh, actually, you can Sorry, I'll just ignore that. Uh, thanks. Uh, really excellent. Well done. Uh, by the way, everyone. Um, so, for instance, this is a mobile call feature that's having similar. So, people can mobile call feature that's having similar. Okay. Yes, and then you can actually install new And I also like to say, this is a super interesting topic. I really you know, can feel myself knowing I'm all in a sense of living on things. Um, I was interested in if you had any reflections on the kind of geographic relevance of the images. Um, I'm thinking uh, I used to work with young people on climate change. I'm um, actually always writing articles about volunteer businesses talking about climate change. But I'm involved in the decision making, and when it went to print, you know, um, Step a picture of a toddler beside the headlines. Climate change, I'll just kind of undermine the message, but um, I, I remember some young people saying that, you know, we always hear about polar bears and ice pop melting, and what what relevance is that to us? And, and I, you know, I see in Australia that also polar bears, not animals that we're familiar with. Um, so I just wanted to, like, both in terms of the Emotional response to um, impacts, but also those projections of what, what might make us feel like we can take action in the future. And like, how, how relevant do you think that, that is for us? Yeah, so I think um, what I'm taking from your question is that, yeah, there's this kind of globalised visual discourse on many things, including climate change. And that's partly because of the media industry that kind of has grown up and, you know, um, that much of the stories that we see are what are called syndicated. So like Reuters or AP, Associated Press, they're what are called news wires. So they'll have correspondents in every country. But they'll effectively like sell their story to different news networks. So much of what you see in, in like ABC or whatever or Guardian will be written by their journalists, but also much of what you see will be written by these kind of syndicated journalists. <laughs> and so the stories are kind of similar, often almost exactly the same. And the, But also the images that go alongside those are from these commercial image banks. Um, and we know from talking to these folks in um, in the image banks, so we haven't done this in a kind of uh, methodologically rigorous way yet, but we're hoping to, um, is that those decisions to tag photographs uh, or certain types of images are taken in a really kind of quite an ad hoc way often. So how something gets tagged as a heat wave is really down to the kind of biases that the person who's doing the tagging is, which is some Western person sitting in London or New York. Um, uh, yeah, so you, when a busy news editor whacks in some search terms, that's what they're going to get. And that's how it kind of gets attached. So it's all about the media logic of how things happen. So how to address that is a major challenge because it's like you're talking about, you know, your uh, your colleagues in the Philippines and so on um, are getting the kind of, you know, dominant Western visual discourse of climate shoved down their throat, which is not relevant and not useful and not engaging. And actually, a lot of what we see is not engaging to people in those in, in the Australia or the UK. I mean, how the polar bear has. Yeah, it's not really relevant to the UK either. Um, become so important is because of these kind of globalized discourses. What we are hoping to do in some future work, hopefully with Catherine, is to um, if we get funded, um, is to look particularly at heat waves, uh, getting vulnerable communities to create their own imagery. So doing photo elicitation. I don't know if you've come across that as a method where you give people like a statement to ask somebody's clapping. Yay, photo elicitation! I love photo elicitation. It's great. Um, to take images like on their phone, basically. Um, you say like, oh, show me how heat waves impact your everyday life over the next week. And then you, um, they take a bunch of photos. You ask them to talk, bring along 20 and do an interview with you. Um, and what you find, you get a whole bunch of interesting stuff way beyond what you might get in an interview, you know, like a standard interview, because they've done it over a much longer time period. Visuals often bring out more interesting kind of data we have found. Um, and then, yeah, we can, we're going to work with commercial image agencies like um, Reuters like Getty to actually get commercial organisations to kind of recreate those because obviously the images that people make on their phones are never going to be used in a global news setting but they can use those kind of visual themes to create different sorts of imagery but also work with those news agencies to change their tagging and their algorithmic kind of biases that bring up certain types of images 
So it's a small start, but yeah. <laughs> well, well, if we get funded, uh, yeah, which is always a big if, isn't it? Uh, um, <laughs> um, I completely agree. It's super fascinating. I want to just go back to the immigrants to say that very few things about the immigrants can either increase CISO score, yeah. whether that climate change or increase agency. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering if so that's framing it as though the zone is going to be slightly in a yeah. What happens if we put one of the images first that increase concern and follow up by increases agency? Yeah. Is what, that, what's is that a spread? What, what's your background? What what discipline would you are you a psychologist is what I'm interested in? Yeah, right. <laughs> Okay, okay, because um, of course that's yeah a really good methodological design and this is like a really simplified representation of what would happen in the real world. The problem with any kind of framing research, so I often use framing theory um, from communications, is that you know what we do in a lab setting or whatever is very different from how people are exposed in the real world to constant image bombardment and you know one image is not the same as the whole you know set of images that are at us and only for split seconds often as well but i think what we're trying to capture with these is the kind of visual wallpaper right the things that we see every day that we don't question um, but yeah, it would be um, another study that we didn't get funded was to do exactly that, to kind of change, to mock up a web page that, that did that and change the sorts of images that people showed and, you know, um, uh, multiple conditions and so on, because that's much more realistic about how things would happen. But we, the simple answer is on climate change images, particularly, we don't know what the interactions are. We don't know if we had a, an image that increased salience, then a self-efficacious image, would that, uh, would that kind of help with, um, with that? moderate things we're not sure please do the research it would be great Yeah. Yeah, good question. Again, like looking at the kind of longer term effects of these, um, that we didn't do that in this study. So I should say that we weren't looking for saliency and efficacy. The way that Q method works is that it, it analyzes the um like the normal distribution and looks at where certain images are grouped, and then you use the interviews to help interpret where those images are. So saliency and self-efficacy are labels that we put on the data from that kind of qualitative interpretation of using the interviews. Um, but yeah, for sure, it would be really interesting to look at longitudinal effects. And I expect, as with all kind of psychological research, you look for longitudinal effects and it basically is very little to, you know, and again, that's what we would expect, right? Because we're seeing these, you know, people in the real world being bombarded by different types of images. And um, climate news is, a study came out the other day, something like in the US, 1.4% of, of news in total. So it's a small percentage of the kind of news that's out there anyway. Um, but I think, yeah, our point generally on visuals is that, um, yeah, they, they're kind of wallpaper images that we're seeing all the time. We, see, we think provoke certain types of effects, um, uh, but what, what would happen if we use kind of more engaging images, images that um, made us think about climate solutions? There's some really interesting work coming out, the Oxford Climate Journalism Network, um, thinking through um, uh, solutions framings rather than um, talking about kind of climate science, actually just going straight to thinking about how we would act, how we should act. Um, and, and that also does interesting things in terms of news because it takes climate change out of um, the politicized arena somewhat. So the kind of he said, she said, um, tit for tat, um, tail making, you know, news from Canberra, which is why you get all those politicians, right? Because it's all the standard political correspondents writing who know nothing about climate change, nothing, nothing bad on them, but they're not climate change specialists. Into the realm of other kinds of reporters, sport, health, um, and others, it, we, we know, connect with different sorts of audiences, for example, we know that health and well-being tends to connect with women, for example, where women are great, uh, more uh, voracious readers of that kind of coverage and are already more receptive to kind of climate change risk as well. So there's lots of different ways in which solutions framing, solutions news could reach different sorts of audiences more effectively. Right. Right. 
Yeah, really, really great question. And again, talking about the kind of how media, how people actually consume media in the in the real world. So a quick kind of anecdote or around thumbnail images is that they tend to be like the most cliched and they have, um, so there's a kind of issue based thing around making them cliched so that audiences immediately know what the topic is about, even if it's really problematic. So even climate and environment correspondents using beach pictures for a heat wave, just because they know that immediately signals it's about heat waves. But also there's an aesthetic thing. Thumbnails are tiny, especially reading on a mobile device. So they've got to be, they've got to look fine in that kind of resolution, which means you get very kind of simple images, like an umbrella, like a parasol on a beach, for example, um, uh, for a heat wave image. So there are lots of kind of aesthetic considerations as well. Um, but you're right, of course, thumbnails are a really important part of, you know, drawing people into a story and then whether they even click on, most people don't click. Um, so yeah, we are looking at that. And one thing we're interested in doing is working with my computer science colleagues, looking at how these things sh get shared in kind of social media spaces. So what sort of framings are engaging? You know, uh, we're working with some um, big um, organisations on doing who um, kind of support people on doing press releases on climate news, for example, looking at how they get shared in um, uh, in social media spaces. What provokes an echo, if you like. Um, and so on. So yeah, following a whole bunch of um, kind of charity and NGOs and seeing how their press releases um, shape, move and shape within that kind of social media space, which is really fascinating. And of course, the image is only a small part of that communication or a part of that whole kind of package. But yeah, we're hoping to do some A-B testing um, with Carbon Brief, which are a cool blog, which some of you might know. Um, Leo Hickman, who who yeah, who I mentioned used to be in the Guardian, is now the, uh, has been for a long time, the, uh, the director there. Um, and they're really receptive to this um, kind of stuff, and they're getting increasingly interested in the social science of climate change, which are needs that we've kind of helped with a little bit. Um, and part of that might be that we could kind of see if different, um, uh, perhaps with them as a partner or others, if we use different sorts of images, how they are shared, so we can really track that in real time. Yeah. Yeah, I was just wondering, actually, like, sorry, maybe someone more broadly to the media uh, yeah so you mean like climate change news generally would have an image that's nothing to do with the story well for example when i did on the beach uh, i wonder if that attracts people yeah. For sure. Yeah, yeah, definitely. We know from talking to journalists that, depending on the outlet, um, a woman in a bikini is quite an appealing image that tends to draw people to your site. So, you know, uh, there are certain types of images that we know in society uh, are more shareable and so on. And, and they, yeah, they do tend to be used um, in, in certain types of outlets. So there's definitely kind of media logics that underlie not only climate change, but other sorts of social issues as well. I think we're interested, obviously we're interested in climate change, kind of environmental social scientists, but um, a lot of what uh, our work kind of does or tries to explain and could kind of talk through different social issues as well. So I was, um, I've was i been on Australia for months and I was at UQ for a week um, working with their visual politics group up there and they work a lot on humanitarian imagery. So they're doing a really interesting study at the moment, which is kind of similar to some of the work we're doing in climate, looking at how, you know, I talked about the woman with the bait and the child on the hip um, and that kind of um, imagery that NGOs, charities use to try and get you to donate. Um, charities know are really problematic, right? They know that they reinforce certain stereotypes. They also know when they've tried other things, donations go down. So they are stuck in a kind of bind there. So their project is trying to create different types of imagery, test them, and then give them kind of advice on how they could act more ethically, but also not, you know, decrease their funding base. So a lot of this stuff about visual politics kind of goes across 
complex social issues beyond climate change as well. So I think what you're saying is totally right. Yeah, because I kind of wanted to be flexible Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And again, goes to those questions about the kind of complex media ecosystem that people are acting within. If you take out these stereotypical images, then do people not click on it? I mean, I don't know. I think some of these things might be a bit overblown. Um, and like the role of, you know, are, do we do we have to have a really problematic and cliched imagery that makes people feel that they don't need to worry about a heat wave in order for people to read the heat wave news? Well, I'm not convinced that that's actually true. And I mean, it depends what media you're looking at. But we know, for example, over 45, 50 year olds are much more likely to watch a TV news broadcast, an evening news broadcast. Younger people definitely don't. It's just not a thing anymore. Massive decline. And problems associated with that but if you change the, the images that go along with that nightly broadcast on heat waves people aren't going to stop watching it's an ingrained habit that they watch you know the new the nightly news the six o'clock or the nine o'clock or whatever it is in australia the 10 o'clock news and um, so i don't know i think i think we could change the visual discourse without kind of there are ways to not lose the audience at the same time and kind of move away from those cliched images um, I'm, I'm asking, I'm one of my main fields of research is looking at the connection between law and visual. And, um, and so I've written quite a lot about the use of images and interaction and visual. Um, and so one of the things that I'm interested in in your studies is what um, standard or methods of interpretation you're applying to your images. And so, in particular, you know, you showed the Brighton Beach and described that as fun in the sun, whereas for many Australians, that was like nightmare in the sun because we're <laughs> not used to people in beaches and we're not used to people in the desert. So, um, obviously, there's sort of, you know, various values and ideas that are going into your understanding of yeah. how you describe them and how you deal with them, which I think is related to images. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, my first question. The second one, um, it's really about the sort of, I don't know, the political direction of this research if you're just really open to sort of describing those phenomena or if you're so that these your findings could be as equally useful for clients to get because they might lead to some of these set of like charity or an NGO who's, who's campaigning on climate change. Are you, are you directly in? Oh, interesting questions, right? You might need to remind me of the first one. I forget the second. Um, so on the first, I also agree that looks like hell on earth. I do not want to go to Brighton Beach. It's heavily, it's really busy, it's full of annoying people down from London. Um, I live in the far southwest of the UK, so hopefully I can get away with saying that. Um, but you're so um I mean I, I primarily do qualitative research, although depending on your discipline, my work can be quite quantitative. A lot of cultural geographers think what I do is, you know, almost all quantitative. So it really depends where you come from as to how you kind of view my work. And partly it's about being interdisciplinary. And although I, I am a human geographer and I'm drawing a lot on kind of framing and um, theory, which you come from communication, media and journalism, um, I, I'm also kind of influenced by other other kind of theoretical approaches as well. I think we're always reflective in our pieces and, and clear about what our positionality is. And we're also using our kind of knowledge of the audiences that we're working with to help interpret those images. So we know that in the UK, that is a, we know from looking at the articles, for example, that how those and the captions and so on, that's how that's been constructed. We, you know, we use the fun in the sum term, but it's not a kind of, unknown and I think that's that paper has become really well spread around a lot um uh online and we think one of the reasons is is because we're using fun and some people recognize it they know what it is so we feel pretty confident that that's a an interpretation that that makes sense and um, of course you always kind of ground truth thing by working with participants working with community groups and so on to check that your your interpretations are valid and um, on the second question really interesting but I would say that kind of goes for many of us who work on climate change right we um, so I'm married to a, a polar climate scientist, and he publishes I sometimes. No, <laughs> I'm really taking it seriously. No, 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 no. Um, so he uh, he publishes some stuff that is about how sea ice is declining, and then some stuff about how actually climate scientists have been quite um, uh, you know too outspoken about how sea ice is you know is is the models are more extreme than they are sort of 
justified to be, for example. And so he has been subject to attack from contrarians and from kind of um, the progressive lobby, if you like, um, and in both directions, you know, oh, well done, your work's fantastic. Oh, your work's complete crap and vice versa. So I think that, you know, it's something that all of us, you can't kind of rejig your research to we try and act as scientists and have well, uh, I don't necessarily do hypothesis testing, but clear research questions where we're open about what our values are and our positionality is on the on the research. Um, uh, yeah, and I would say also we are working with um, some really quite important actors globally on communications. So we feel, yeah, fairly um, fairly sure that we're we're trying to kind of put our values where our mouth is, if you like. Um, in 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 helping towards climate action, but of course, you know, um, contrarians could look at our work and and could um, could use it in nefarious ways. But I don't think there's a way with open science to avoid that. One thing I would say is that one of my PhD students has had a freedom of information request from a really well known climate contrarian. So we're obviously doing something to upset contrarians. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, so anyone else? Can see <laughs> thanks, thanks, Sarah. Amazing talk, really were. Um, I think you just touched on the briefly about the intergenerational side of this, and so for me, I'm wondering whether you've done much work in terms of the demographical understanding of what might make sense for younger people, but for older people. And I so the lead to that question was I mentioned your work. One of my daughters the other day, and she said, Oh, Getty, I know Getty. They never let me copy their work. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So, you know, there's, there's an audience there that's really interested in using those yeah. And how appropriate are they? You know, so mm. this kind of thought from that. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so we haven't, um, a lot of the work we've done, we're looking at kind of generalised discourses rather than looking for kind of representative sample, samples. So there are different ways that you can kind of cut the pie or do the research, I guess. Um, but um, I do have a couple of PhD students, one currently working, looking at YouTube, um, looking at marine sustainability particularly as kind of one element of climate change, or you could say marine, climate change, one element of marine sustainability, um, um, particularly with digital um users use digital users so we know that a lot of these audiences are really heavy and heavily engaged online and activism and so on so um we are doing some work on that particularly um and another P uh, so that's uh, kate holden and another phd student uh, cass lee who's now graduated and um, looking at how people um uh, engage more broadly with climate change but not specifically visuals although visuals has come into her work a little bit and what's really interesting about her work she looked at the few uh, the school strikes and she looked at strikers and non-strikers and people who wanted to strike but weren't allowed to because, you know, their children and their parents have some sway. Um, so and it, it's really hard to do work with youth. I don't know if anyone in the audience has done work with children, but, you know, the ethics it is hard. Um, uh, so she and that's why a lot of studies we found say that they look at youth, but actually look at 25 plus, which is not necessarily what you might think of as a youth audience. So Kath was, Kath's work was looking at 10 year olds up to 19 year olds um, when it was super interesting. She was doing work in school with parental consent and so on. And what she found across strikers and non-strikers and people who wanted to strike but couldn't um, was that they held broadly similar views, even though they kind of, you know, you can imagine that in, in later times they might vote differently politically. They all felt that climate change was an issue of intergenerational injustice and they all felt strongly about climate action. Um, and yeah, there were there were more similarities than differences between those different groups, which is really fascinating. It's work that's now published in Nature Climate Change. Is one of those, I can't remember, it's Data Insight or something. It's one of the first piece that they had on qualitative research. It's like, we're quite pleased that we've got it in there. Um, yeah. I feel like there are no questions and answers. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah, right. So we haven't, or well, I haven't looked at cartoons specifically. It is in this study. So we did look at all kinds of different types of images or what uh, kind of images emerge. And there has been some work. Kate Manzo from the University of Newcastle has done a little bit of work looking at cartoons. Um, but no, we haven't specifically. I think we've 
cartoons are one step, but we're increasingly moving on to thinking about memes um, rather than cartoons per se. And one of my fab PhD students, Ned Westwood, who's a, a political scientist, but with a lot of computa computational science training, um, work main supervised by Travis Cohen. He's looking at um, memes particularly in the US. Um, and uh, how they proliferate and how particularly they construct heroes and villains using the same image, but in different ways, really fascinating. So obviously that's a text image interplay, which is, oh, that's another critique that nobody's mentioned, but you definitely can make of all of this stuff, is that we're looking at often text on their own and not at the kind of surrounding information. So looking at those kind of multimodal things. So yeah, sort of, but not, I guess is the answer. Thank you very much, so really wonderful, really insightful, really clever. Very exciting. And thanks for all your energy and being there. Thank you. Your food. Yeah, I'm going to make one about the yeah. global side. Yeah. 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 Yeah.